God-filled day, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, they told me one day I'd be, f I'd be faint. You have to be behind. I could do that. <laughs> one day, one day they told me I'd be famous so that my makeup would start to fall off because the heat. I just didn't know it'd just be because I'm outside. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So let us um. Assume the position, because this is our meditation time. This is our time to allow that still small voice to be heard. It's that place within us. It's that place within us that we get to commune with that higher power, that source within, that spirit, the very voice of God. So we place both feet on the ground, and if you're comfortable, put your palms in your, on your thighs. And we just breathe. This is not meant to be an exercise where we work up a sweat. It's just an exercise to breathe in the presence of God. To be part of this experience that we call getting still. So we breathe, we take a conscious breath. 
feeling that breath of God enter our being to allow ourselves to lower our heart rate, lower the need for oxygen, and we just allow the breath of God to enter our being. For within us, it is a clear day. There is no obstacles in our way. The path to a higher expression of God is paved freely. No shrubbery, no stones, nothing in the way of being in the stillness with God. So we give ourselves permission to just be here right now, ever mindful that this is our time where we listen. We listen to the still small voice of God. If you are so called, bring something to mind that is troublesome or bothersome. It doesn't raise your anxiety, but just a, a communication with God. And then we let it go. And we turn it over to the hands of God for the perfect outworking, the perfect connection with God. For if God is in charge, then let us turn it over to God. Let God handle our problems or concerns. We just be here right now. If our mind wanders off, we take a breath and feel the breath and center ourselves once more. Just breathe. So ever so gently bring ourselves back to this time of now and gently open your eyes and, and just breathe in all the goodness of God that you have now and will have tomorrow. And so it is. Amen. And so it is. Amen. So today's lesson is from the book of First Samuel. And now Samuel has a long life. And as much as I'd love to take two, three hours of your time and talk to you about Samuel, I'm going to keep it brief to just up until the Ark of the Covenant, which is just a blink of his eye. And so the first Samuel starts out with Hannah, his mother, is wife number two of a wonderful man who loves her dearly. But she is barrenless, has not been able to have children. And so every year they have to go and pay homage and deliver their goods to what we would call the church, the tabernacle. They would make the journey every year and drop off their, their fattest calf, their grain, and they would give homage once a year. And so on this trip over there, wife number one, who is just prolific with children, brags on Hannah and actually is verbally abusive to Hannah and really puts her down for not being able to bear children. She's a nana, 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 you know, that whole thing. And Hannah hates it and gets bitter with God for being barrenless. And she develops a habit 
and a persona of being very angry with God, with her husband's other wife, and with the world in general. So she goes to the tabernacle, and she decides to ask God for help. So she puts herself down and says, please, allow my womb to open up so that I can bear a son. And she does it with such, such conviction that Eli, who is the, pre, the head priest of this tabernacle, all of Israel, can see her talking, her mouth moving, but no words. And she, he thinks she's drunk. Because when you go to pay homage, you also bring a lot of liquor with you. So it wasn't uncommon for people to be drunk in front of the tabernacle. Okay, So he assumes she's drunk, and she, he's pushing her away. And she says, I haven't had anything to drink, but I'm clear on what just happened for me. My prayer will be answered. Her bitterness is gone, her continence changes, and she walks away with her shoulders held up saying, I'm going to have a child, and it will be a son. And the price she pays for this prayer to God is that she commits this son to God, to be a full servant of the Lord. She's clear on this matter. Lo and behold, she gets pregnant and has a son. Na 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 na, she gets to boast. And as it turns out, later in her life, she has many children. But son number one, Samuel, is betrothed over to the church. And she knows this, doesn't change her mind. She is emphatic about it. She's so emphatic about it that when the year passes and she has to go to the tabernacle to make her her offerings with her family, she declines. And she says, I'm not willing to go back to the tabernacle until my son has been weaned, until he no longer needs its mother. Before, because when I go back to the tabernacle, I'm turning my son over. So the child gets weaned, and he's dropped off at the temple. He is now, belongs totally, every part of Samuel's life is committed to serving God. He knows it. His mother knows it. The family is rewarded for this because not every family turns over a son to the, to the tabernacle, but she does. So now they're in favor. God's, God's eyes see favor on them at this time. So in her quest to make sure her son gets the best of everything while he's in the tabernacle, she sews him a robe every year. And he gets to walk around the temple, not in scraps like the others who have been given over to the temple, but in a fine robe every year. He is presented to the temple as the one. And she's clear. So as time goes on, Samuel, one night, he is doing his best to sleep. When he's pretty clear, he hears God calling his name. He hears his name being called. He doesn't know where it's coming from because this is this part of history that God didn't talk out loud often. There was a silence period here. And who are the enemy of the Israelites? The Philistines. Will they ever go away? No. Because what are Philistines are negative thoughts. So they never go away, do they? Darn those Philistine thoughts. You know, you want to take them out and shoot them and make them go away. We want to stomp on them. And every once in a while, we'll get a negative thought. We'll stomp on it. It goes away. And then another one fills its place. Those darn Philistines. So as it turns out, the Philistines are ruling the Israelites. They are kicking their butts and telling them what to do. So here's this tabernacle. And of course, now I've spoken that the alms are given every year. Well, Eli, who is in charge of the whole tabernacle, is the spiritual guide for all of Israelites. He has two sons, and they're not so keen. They're not so nice. They take all the best gifts that are given, and they take advantage of all the poor women who show up at the tabernacle every year. You know what I mean by taking advantage? Okay, not good. And word's getting out in the community that his sons are a little bit wayward. In fact, so wayward that they're questioning whether they're actually called by God. They're questioning Eli's status in the community. And Eli's an older man, and it's, it's funny that his eyesight is dimming. And they make a point of this in the, in the gospel story, in the uh, 
the story of 1 Samuel about his eyesight weaning. And it's harder and harder for him to see. And so God speaks to him and says, Eli, we got a problem. Your sons are bad. You need to clean up your act. Eli says, yeah, I know, and does nothing. He does nothing. He claims he's too old and his eyesight is too poor. He doesn't really see what's going on. He puts age in front of serving God. Not good. So Samuel's sleeping one day, and he hears his name called, and he says the most famous words ever, here I am. We hear that often. Here I am. He thinks Eli has called him. He runs off to Eli and says, yeah, what do you want? And Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. He goes back to bed. He's called again. And he says, here I am. Runs off to Samuel and Samuel says, listen, seriously, I didn't call you. He goes back a third time. And here's the, the voice calling him, Samuel, Samuel. He runs back to Eli and says, seriously, you know, you got to stop this. And Eli says, oh, God is speaking to you. Go back to your chambers and say, I am your servant, what can I do? And he does that. And God speaks fluently with him and tells him the future. And at that moment, Samuel, as a young teenager, becomes a prophet. God is speaking directly to him and telling him what's going to happen, and it ain't pretty. Samuel, the next day, is with Eli, and Eli says, so you talked with God, right? He said, yeah. He said, you got to tell me. you got to tell me what God said. And Samuel's hesitant because he already knows not to trust Eli. He tells him anyway. And the prophecy is that Eli and his entire family and the Ark of the Covenant will be destroyed. Not pleasant news. Eli hears it and goes, yeah, well, that doesn't surprise me. God told me I was going to have a, a heck of a time. A few years go by, the Philistines attack the Israelites and a few thousand soldiers are killed. And the Israelite soldiers come back to the, to the town where the tabernacle is and says, we need God's help. Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant with us. And then we'll be protected. So they show up at the battlefield with the Ark of the Covenant and the two people taking possession of the tabernacle are Eli's two sons. Because this is the Ark of the tab Tabernacle. This is important stuff. So they bring it to the battlefield and they lose miserably. Tens of thousands of Israelites are killed by the Philistines. Negative thoughts. And the two sons are killed. And the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. Prized possession. Now in the hands of the Philistines. And metaphysically, the Philistines are negative thoughts. And now they have the Ark of the Covenant. It means they have total dominion over our thoughts. The good thoughts can't even come through anymore. We are totally obsessed with the bitterness, the negativity, we're angry, all of that stuff that takes place that is less than positive is now running rampant through the land. And a soldier escapes and he comes back to Eli and he says, I got really, really bad news. The Ark of the Covenant's gone. They captured it. And Eli's like, oh man. And then he hears that his two sons died in the process. And he falls over the stone, breaks his neck, and dies. Pleasant, isn't it? Right. The house of Eli is gone. There are no heirs for the tabernacle. And Samuel becomes the prophet for Israel. And that's the end of our story in the Bible for Samuel up until the fourth chapter, 1 Samuel. Then you, if you're so inclined, feel free to read the rest of Samuel because Samuel lives a very long, fruitful life in the hands of God and the Israelites. It's a wonderful story. But his formative years really pick and, and take and leave us with such a wonderful story. The, there are three characters, right? Hannah, his mother. The first thing she does is she prays, right? And she not only prays for her son, she knows her prayer has been answered. And she lives her life from that moment on as if the prayer was answered. How many of us do that? We live in doubt about our prayers. We go, well, I don't know if he heard me or not. And I don't know if this is going to happen. I really want it to happen. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. And we vacillate back and forth. 
She didn't. She immediately took on the presence as if she was already the mother of this son. And she commits to giving her son away, and she keeps her agreement. How many of us have beseeched God, I'll do anything you want, God? You know, please, please just answer my prayer in that moment of our darkness of the soul. And then do we keep that promise after our prayers are answered? Most of us forget what it is we even promised. She not only didn't forget, she ensured from the moment that boy was born that he was prepared to be a servant of God. Now, if that's not faith, I don't know what is. That's a good example of faith. She takes on the knowingness of the answered prayer without ever seeing any proof of the answered prayer. She, she's, she's living it. And she embodies it. Huge. And she prepares his life. She doesn't begrudgingly say, oh, that's right, I said I'd give my first son. Oh, no, don't take him. No. She didn't do any of that. She willingly lets him go to serve God. Totally gives up her firstborn. Big deal, isn't it? Yeah. The second thing is Samuel hearing God call him and him saying, here I am. He is in total service to God and will do whatever it takes. He gets confused. He thinks it's Eli calling him, but he clears that confusion up. Three times he's called. What does three mean? Completion. The Trinity. In mathematics, it's the prime number. Three's a big deal. And it's protection, guidance, and help from divine forces. Because remember, he's a prophet, not a leader. Sam was a prophet. Very different. David was a leader. Samson was a true believer in God with his force. But Samuel's a prophet. He's predicting what will happen. So he predicts the death of Eli and his two sons and the loss of the Ark of the Covenant. And he lives through that. And because of that, the whole time he's given prophecies and he projects them and tells people and they all come true. Because he's got the ears of God, doesn't he? And Eli, God bless Eli, he is a perfect example of us knowing we're doing something wrong and we do it anyway. He doesn't care. He uses the excuse of his blindness and his age as a way to perpetuate a negative circumstance. I know none of you would ever do that. But it is so easy for us to fall into that trap. I'm too old, I don't care, it doesn't matter, I can't make a difference. And he pays the raft for it. Because if we stay in that negative state of mind, we will go blind, won't we? We can no longer see the truth. And for Eli, even though he was called to be the prophet for the Israelites, he gave up his duties. He let them go. And he never even followed up to make sure his sons would have the proper tutoring. He gave it all up. He just washed it away. And when we do that, we have a symbolic sense of death in our lives. So this story, short as it is, it's only four verses. Three major things happen in this story. And they're big ones. They're profound. You know, the faith we have in our request for prayer and trusting and living as if the prayer is answered with no gray. And then listening to the call and being willing to say, here I am. I'm listening. What do you got? You see, the analogy here is real simple. We're in this form of, form of pandemic. We can't hug. We can't do the things that would be very nice if we could resume, right? We all wish for that. And yet at the same time, we, at our Friday happy hour, a question was raised. What qualities do you perceive in a good friend? And it got me thinking. And I'm sorry, but I did. I thought about it. And it brought me back to 1 Samuel. Because what he got with God was the skill of listening. The skill of listening. And isn't that one of the attributes we see in friends? We want to be heard. We want to be listened to. And so when a friend comes to you and you're chatting, you listen. You have ears that are big as saucers. And you listen intently with what might be going through this person's life, good, bad, or indifferent. You listen. 
And that's what Samuel represents, the ability to listen. So your homework is about listening to God. See, we're all good about this. Blah, 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 blah. We talk. Now it's time to listen. And it's not just in meditation that we listen, although that's the best way to listen. But to listen to what's going on around us. You see, the five senses get a bad rap. You know? But the truth is, we use our senses to listen to God. Amazing things will be seen, heard, smelled, touched. Taste. Thank you. And tasted. All through the symptoms of God. Because God is everywhere, right? God is everywhere, right? Yeah. So if God is everywhere, guess where God is? Here. You, me, everywhere. So your homework is to listen and use your five senses to see the work of God. To see it, feel it, taste it, hear it. For God is everywhere. And when you hear it, you get to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. What's up? And then we listen to that still small voice. Godspeed. And remember, Samuel means literally heard by God. And so it is. Amen. We accept your love offerings. We did a little better job this week than last week. Feel free to, to drop off your love offerings. All gifts are accepted. And now if you'll join us with Miss Donna as she closes our service. Take, let this be my joyous vow. 